Well, folks, <clears throat> excuse me. If you don't see me, don't be alarmed. I am indeed actually here. I'm just a little bit off camera. But I am here. I do exist. It is happening. This is indeed Tent Talks Tunes for October 26th, 2022. And yeah, I don't know. I'm not necessarily trying to make this a big dramatic entrance, but it's just kind of working out that way. The reason being that I honestly believe the best way to work out the kinks and the weird bits in a situation is to just do it completely whole hog, 100% live, in the real, in the raw, just completely cold, not knowing what's going to happen next. And that's what's happening right here, right now in Tent Talks Tunes. You don't see me, but you hear me. And the reason that you hear me but don't see me presumably, is because I'm fiddling with my camera off screen, trying to put it into this holder thing, and I think I got it. Okay, so here I am. Look at that. I'm making my entrance on camera right now, right here, right now. I'm doing it, and it would certainly appear that I am indeed now live on the dreaded Facebook to bring you Tent Talks Tunes. So you might wonder, what is this all about? What is the fuss and bother here? Why am I making this weird entrance from stage right and doing all this fiddling around? It's because for the first time in my multi-year career as a vlogger or whatever you call a guy who goes on Facebook Live every Wednesday to talk tunes, I have a brand new camera. Brand new camera, yes. I know it's been my hallmark for the past almost three years for me to get on Tent Talks Tunes live on the Facebook and gripe, moan, and complain about the lousy caca doo doo quality of my camera. Well, I think we've got that situation completely addressed now. I started off with the cheapest possible camera you could possibly get because I didn't know what I was doing. And that sort of got me started. And then La Dama Dorada y su esposa very kindly sent me a better camera. Yes, they sent me a better camera and that kept me going for a while. And now that camera that they sent me has led me to the camera that I have now, which is, it's a really weird complex thing. I wish you guys could, I wish I had the ability to show you, <coughs> excuse me, what it is I'm dealing with here. This Little tiny camera, it's about the size of a pack of cigarettes, excuse me again, is mounted on a, like a full-size professional camera tripod, like a big thing with the legs that extend and spread out, and you can take the little stick in the middle and make it go up and down and point it this direction and that direction and swivel it up and down and all that. You can do that. It's on one of those tripods, and separate of that, I've got my cell phone, on a stand, which is where all the control mechanism is for this thing. So in order to direct it and turn it on and turn it off, I'm reliant on my phone. Whereas before, I would just take the camera, hook it up to my computer, and, you know, do everything live on my keyboard and on my computer. So this is an entirely new, different thing. And so I hope you guys will bear with me a little bit as I futz with it and work out the bugs. For example, one thing I can see right now is that the perspective is kind of weird. We've got a lot of space on top. Um, I know that there's a way to zoom in. I just don't know how to do it yet. So we're going to have one static camera angle with a lot of weird space over my head. And um, that's going to do until I can dope this stuff out. You know what I'm saying, yo? You know what I'm saying, yo. And now, <clears throat> another weird disconcerting thing is that in order for me to see who's tuned in and who's making comments... I have to very awkwardly reach over so that my forehead is pretty much right there in the camera lens. And it's probably all you can see. Actually, yeah, I guess you can see my whole face. Look, huh? here I am, guys. How's that for a close-up? Is that an okay close-up? Mayhap better than the close-ups that I was doing before. Oh, boy. Invite your pet into the room and have them stare at the screen and look at this. So in order to 
actually check out who is watching and who's commenting. I have to lean awkwardly directly into the camera and um, stare at the screen while you guys stare at a giant size close up of my face. How weird is that? As Mike from Vancouver, BC says, new camera, same old face. Yep, I can't, I cannot go to the five and under store and buy a brand new face. Not that I would want to. I kind of like the one I got. <clears throat> My girl kind of likes the one I got. We're kind of stuck with it, aren't we? There we go. Let's drink some of that good Danbury tap in a toast to this face right here. So I don't know, guys. How does it look? Does it make any sense? Um, how's the resolution? Can you hear me? Can you see me? Does any of this make any sense at all? My number one man wants to know, where is Harry? I don't know where Harry is. I think Harry is on the prowl right now. Um, Harry's been in and out all day. Harry was quite lonely because I was on the road recently with my good pal Tim Holhouse, touring New England in the beautiful autumn season. There is nothing better than getting to cruise around Massachusetts, Rhode Island, Connecticut, New Jersey, and Pennsylvania at the height of the fall leaf changing season. It was just gorgeous out there and the weather was perfect. Even on the one or two days we had that were like really overcast and rainy, <clears throat> it was still perfect because that's very autumnal weather and it just worked. It was a really, really good run of shows and a lot of fun. Tim is a great guy to tour with. Um, getting to watch him play his music every night was a pleasure meeting all the bands that we met, staying with all the friends we stayed with, new people that we met. Really, really cool. It's what touring is all about. Hopefully you guys have been seeing my updates on the Facebook um, as I've been going along, posting. Hopefully, you know, I, was try I tried to post every single day about where we were and what we were doing and who we were playing with. So if you guys have been following that, then you can see what kind of an adventure it's been. So... That's great, but of course, Harry was kind of sad and lonely during the time I was gone. But, um, you know, we've rebonded, we've reconnected, and Harry's doing great. He's out stalking, I'm pretty sure, and if we know him, he just might yet jump in the window while I'm on live, and he might even jump up on the desk and make an appearance. So, thank you, Larry Mann, for asking. See, this is great. I can actually look at the screen now and see who's tuned in and who's making comments. Von, none of your damn business. Tent Talks Tim, you are so right. Pear from Sweden, hello. Everybody, thank you. I still can't see everybody who's tuned in, but I can see that you are tuned in, and I'm glad to have you on board. So yeah, the, the savage irony about having been on tour for eight days and then being home for about a week is that I'm going out on the road again tomorrow. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yes, I'm hitting the road again tomorrow for some exciting business with the almighty Anti-Scene. Yes, Anti-Scene's new Ultra lineup is making its debut. Very, very soon. November 3rd at Reggie's in Wilmington, North Carolina. November 4th at Jack Rabbit's in Jacksonville, Florida. November 5th at the Alabama Music Box in Mobile, Alabama. That's a bit of a swerve. If you go to Mobile, Alabama and say, hey, am I in Mobile? They'll know you're not from around there, so don't go there and say Mobile. It's like going to New York City and asking for where Houston Street is. It ain't going to fly. They're going to know you're not from around there, bub. So it's Houston Street in New York City and Mobile in Alabama. Cheers to Mobile, Alabama. Mm, 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 mm. So yes, that's what's happening next weekend. This weekend, I am playing a solo set at the Brown Mountain Lights Festival in Morganton, North Carolina. My good pal Stacy Peak from the most excellent record shop, Green Eggs and Jam, is hosting it. I'll be on the bill with Joe Buck yourself. I'll be on the bill with an honest to gosh Elvis impersonator. There's a black metal band hosting, uh, headlining, I should say. Lots of great stuff. Downtown Morganton, all day on the 29th of October, which is this coming Saturday. 
I will be doing my set of Unwanted Devo music. I don't know when I'll be doing that set again. There are no plans for gigs solo after this one. So if you're anywhere near Morganton, and even if you're not, and you want to make the effort to come on down and see what's going to be the last performance of my Unwanted Devo set <clears throat> this Saturday at 4 p.m., 4 p.m., 4 p.m., me on the stage, dressed in my Devo duds with a uh, rhythm box and an electric guitar. It's going to be all right. So yeah, a lot of stuff going on, man. A lot of stuff going on. What else is going on as I scan the horizon? Oh, of course. How could I have forgotten November 5th? The Danbury Record and CD Expo is happening at VFW Hall number 149 in downtown Danbury. A room full of record dealers peddling their wares for hungry, monomaniacal, musical maniacs like you and like me. Ironically enough, I won't be there even though I'm co-promoting the event because I'm going to be in Mobile, Alabama. But this is a thing you got to go to. Lots of dealers, including many who have never sold before in Danbury. Look on my Facebook page. Look on my website, malcolmtent.us. Sorry, malcolmtent.net. Go to malcolmtent.net. Right there on the home page, you will see a flyer that looks a lot like this. That has all the information you need about the Danbury Record and CD Expo. Drink some Danbury Tap to the Danbury Record and CD Expo. Hmm. Ah. <coughs> so, yeah. <clears throat> the <clears throat> Excuse me. I've come to realize, I think I know now why, when I go on Tent Talks tunes, I'm always coughing and clearing my throat and, like, <clears throat> going like this. It's because... I'm projecting my voice too hard. I'm trying to throw my voice over to the camera with the built-in microphone. I'm hoping that when I look at this, when I'm looking at the rerun of this broadcast tonight, that I will hear audio that sounds real good and I will get it established in my mind that I can talk in a normal conversational tone and that I don't have to try to project and wear out my delicate larynx. Another benefit of having a fancy schmancy new camera. We hope. We're working for. We're praying for it to be true. Brethren and sisters, please send a prayer for my speaking voice and the hopes that the fancy new microphone in this camera will pick it up and I can talk to you normal like. Yes. Oh, I see a bunch of hearts. That's great. I love it. I can actually see stuff like that now. This is right away this camera upgrade is paying dividends because I can actually see you people reacting in real time. I love this. This is awesome. Awesome. All right. So when I was on tour with Tim, we played eight shows in eight nights. And my modus operandus whenever I go on tour is to play the show at night, go to record stores during the day. Oh, boy. You can see where this is leading now, right? I visit the record stores in every town that we go to, and I've got a great big old spread of TPOS releases. And if you want to have an idea of uh, what it is I cart around, go on to Discogs and look up TPOS, and you'll see that I've got lots and lots and lots of releases. Lots of releases. And so I go to all the record stores that I possibly can and trade my stuff for theirs. And then I come back with a whole bunch of things that I can either flip for sale or keep for myself, all of which I like to talk to you people about because talking about music is way fun. Love the artifacts, love everything about it. <clears throat> but before we do that, now Mike says, put a monitor by me. I do have a monitor by me, Mike. You can't see it, but it's right there, right there, only inches away from me. So if you see me looking down in that direction, that's me looking at the monitor. 
And um, allegedly, too, when I if I use my cell phone as a controller, I can zoom in on things. I can zoom in on this flyer or that sign or this fabulous T-shirt design. Insiders only on this one. But I haven't mastered that art yet, so I'm, I don't really know exactly how to do that. We're all learning together here, my frantic fans, my friends, my loyal listeners, my vivacious viewers. We are all... Remember that old saying, we're all in this together? Well, we are now, because we're learning how to use this camera together. So anyway, before I get into the Hall of Swag... I need to address the mail situation. We've talked about what's on the bulletin board. Let's talk about the mail. Um, kind of luckily, only one box arrived in my absence. And it was from the unimpeachable president for life, Jeff Clayton, the fearless leader and conductor of the anti-scene death train. He sent me a box of stuff, including this exclusive insiders-only design of an anti-scene anti t-shirt featuring the great, the irreplaceable, the irrepressible Cosmic Commander of Wrestling, sorely missed, one of the most unique personalities I've ever met in my entire life, and a man who is devoted to professional wrestling and Sun Ra. What's not to love? He tried really hard not to be lovable, but I liked the guy. A toast to the Cosmic Commander. <clears throat> I was tempted to say the late Cosmic Commander, but I learned that Rasta does not say late. Rasta says early when somebody leaves the Earth and goes into the Great Beyond. They're early because they got there before we did. And in the case of the Cosmic Commander, I think that is completely appropriate to say the early Cosmic Commander. We'll be catching up with him somewhere down the road. So what else did Jeff Clayton send me besides this excellent t-shirt? Here's an artifact. This might come in handy during the cold, cold winter months at Beckon. How about this? Very fashionable, but also extremely warm hat that used to be owned by none other than Scott Savage himself. Now you might ask yourself, Scott Savage, who is, who is Scott Savage? If you're, if you're from North Carolina generally or Charlotte specifically, the name Scott Savage carries a lot of weight. Scott Savage had a band called The Streets Living Theater, which was very important to the growth and development of the almighty anti-scene. And Scott Savage, who I'm only learning about as I go along here, I never really knew about the dude until I started, you know, playing bass for anti-scene. Scott Savage had, a, uh, had the band Streets Living Theater for a long time, and he was a, a poet and a musician and a producer, and he produced some really, really cool and interesting stuff, um, including a seven-inch single called Scott Savage's Memento Mori, which was recently reissued by Jeff Clayton on his label, Long-Haired Weirdo Records. Um, really good stuff. The only band I've ever heard that actually has a kind of Doors feel to it. I can honestly not think of any bands that sound like The Doors, but Scott Savage with Memento Mori and or Streets Living Theater come pretty close, and most of it is because of Scott Savage's singing voice, which naturally sounds like Jim Morrison's. I honest, I don't believe the guy was trying to sound like Jim Morrison. I think he just had a singing voice that sounded like Jim Morrison, especially when he got into yelling and shouting mode. He really sounded like Jim Morrison. And I can empathize with that because I've had people telling me since day one that I sound like Jello Biafra. In the United States of America, whenever I play a show, at least quite often when I play a show, people will come up to me and say, Wow, man, you sound just like Jello Biafra. Can't help it. Can't help it. My BFF forever, Jill, she told me the same thing when I was still in 12th grade. And we'd only just heard the Dead Kennedys for the first time. She said, Wow, you sound like the guy who sings for that band. What can I tell you? My nasal cavity, my larynx, the bone structure of my head, they must be identical to Jello Biafra's. I can't help it. Um, in England, they say that I sound like Ludon Wainwright III. I don't see or hear that at all. I can definitely see and hear the resemblance between my voice and Jello Biafra's voice. 
Ludon Wainwright III, I do not hear it. I do not comprehend it. I do not understand it. Do you people out there have any opinions on this? Ludon Wainwright III and me having stylistic similarities with our voices? I, I don't know. I'm, 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 am I missing something? I don't know. You got to help a brother out. I just don't know. It's weird. It's weird. Pear, you're from Sweden. Did Ludon Wainwright III have a lot of weight in Sweden? Apparently, he was pretty big in England. Um, here in the States, he's best known for having a couple of walk-on bits during the first season of M.A.S.H. He would, like, there'd be a scene, you know, in South Korea during M.A.S.H., and all of a sudden, this guy with a guitar sort of strolls across the screen singing and playing a song, and that was Ludon Wainwright III. Why, I don't know, but they got rid of him pretty quick, and that was basically what he was known for. Do I sound like that guy? Put a, put some fatigues on me and give me a guitar and point a TV camera at me. Maybe I can pass for Ludon Wainwright III. I don't know. Clueless. Clueless. So yeah, here I am wearing Scott Savage's very warm cap and very fashionable cap. And I'm also in possession of an extremely rare... Yay, perhaps even one-of-a-kind cassette tape by the aforementioned Streets Living Theater. Now, here's where we're going to try the capabilities of this new camera. I'm going to zoom on in, and in theory, you'll be able to see this in nice, clear, sharp, somewhat high-definition video. And also, in theory, the... Uh, the lens won't make an annoying clicking sound when I zoom in. And also, for the one guy out there, for the one guy out there who had a complaint about me waving stuff in front of the camera lens, don't worry, bubby. Once I master the art of this remote control thing, I will be able to hold this up and zoom in on it. So you can quit your belly ache in and enjoy Tent Talks Tunes in its newfangled, highfalutin, technologically advanced glory, baby. Anyway, here it is. Streets Living Theater, complete 80-minute live performance, and two, two, hither, unknown, unreleased studio tracks. Um, I digitized this last night. That's all I'm going to say. But if you guys are fans of original 70s and 80s rock, and I do mean original, uh, these guys were definitely doing things that nobody else was doing at the time. If you're a fan of that kind of thing, just keep your eye and ear on this very internet for exciting new developments. Exciting new developments relating to Streets Living Theater. Scott Savage's hat is so effective that I'm going to take it off right now because my bald spot is starting to sweat. And that is not very glamorous. And as we know, the only reason I do this is for the glamour. It's about the glamour first and foremost. Let's drink a toast to glamour. Ah. Let's see, Pear from Sweden has um, come in with a comment on Ludon Wainwright III. Pear says... Doesn't know much about the guy, but he was played on the radio. See, now, Ludon Wainwright III probably got no radio airplay whatsoever in the States. <clears throat> so once again, our brethren across the pond, our cisterns across the pond, have a little more oomph to their mass media than we do when it comes to people like Ludon Wainwright III. Or Sun Ra, for that matter. Sun Ra was on primetime television in Europe. They would give him a 90-minute slot on primetime nationwide TV in Poland or Germany or Italy. You know? And the most he ever got on TV in the States was five minutes on Saturday Night Live and 20 minutes on night music. That was it. American cultural TV mass media is benighted. What else is in this box, hmm? I'm kind of rambling tonight. I'm in a good mood. So I'm going to ramble on. 
Another very interesting thing on cassette. I'm not really sure what's going on with this. We haven't actually talked about this, but this is another thing for those of you who are interested in North Carolina history. This is something that I, I kind of knew existed, but wasn't really sure. The Rawhead Rex demo tape. Rawhead Rex was an early obnoxious punk rock creation of Greg Clayton, the younger brother of Jeff Clayton and uh, later drummer of Anti-Scene, current owner of Aardvark Printing in North Carolina, where this shirt was made. Check that cassette out. That is a 100% Sertron three for a dollar cassette that the Rawhead Rex demo was dubbed onto. And look at that punk rock logo. Tell me that ain't punk rock. That's so punk rock, I'm incredulous. So not only did Jeff Clayton send me this, like, consumer copy of the Rawhead Rex demo, he sent me the very master tape that Rawhead Rex product was made from. Very exciting. Another trivia fact, TPOS number 062 was a 7-inch single by Rawhead. And it's been out of print for over, not over, but about 30 years. We might be moving towards something with Rawhead. Once I know, you'll know. Another great Rawhead artifact, an original cut-and-paste flyer. I've talked a lot on Tent Talks Tunes about my love for hard copies like print zines and uh, magazines and things like that. And the fact that back in the old day, you'd make a flyer with a pot of glue and a pair of scissors and some rub-on letters. And as you can see by the gloss, an actual printed photograph. And so this is a real artifact from the 90s. A flyer made painstaking stakingly with rub-on letters and every every element cut out with a pair of scissors and glued to a piece of paper. Love it. Love it. Digital is fun, mind you. I've I've really been um I've really been diving into digital graphics the past few years and I'm I'm getting fairly adept at it. I won't say good just yet, but I'm I'm getting there. I'm actually acquiring a skill set with digital design, and I really enjoy it. But there's just something about this real, honest to God, 100% analog way of making a flyer that just, it can't be beat, you know? Just the action of, you know, rubbing the letters on one at a time with a blunt object. And, like, if you guys were there back in the day, you know what I'm talking about. One letter at a time. Ugh, fantastic. Fantastic. Wow. I'll drink a toast of tap to that. Can I see some amens? Anybody out there? Mike Lesser, I know. I'm sure that you spent your time rubbing letters onto a piece of paper with a blunt object. Any, any punk rocker out there who tried to promote their band or make a record sleeve or a, a demo insert spent many hours at a typewriter and or a sheet of paper with those rub-on letters. Or for that matter, just markers, pens, all the tools of the trade. Love it. Yeah, I see some of you people, I can actually see the thumbs up now. Some of you people have toiled in that particular salt mine. What else did we get here in this box from old JC? Well, obviously we got some product. This is very exciting. I'm not on this record, but I remember when the original version of this record came out, over 30 years ago. It has been reissued now on a label from Spain. Yes, a good old label from the good old country of Spain, Bang Records. I'm sure Spain is another country that uh, gave a little more air time to Ludon Wainwright III than we ever did. But this is a uh, retrospective of a lot of the very, very early anti-scene stuff. It's got the Drastic EP, the NC Royalty EP, and uh, I do believe some bonus cuts. Yep, definitely some bonus cuts. Or is this... Um... Yeah, don't ask me. I can't remember these things. But it's really cool. Only in Spain and available on 
anticene.com. Very limited pressing. Hmm. Got mine. You need to get yours. And I will also mention an anti-scene record that I am on, Quarantine 2. Look at that bass playing maniac, man. Woo-wee! Career highlight, kids. Since joining Anti-Scene, I've had any number of career highlights. This is one of them. Not only in a beautiful full-color LP cover, not only stunning colored vinyl, but also full color, full sized booklet. And if you don't recognize the graphic layout of this, then you're obviously not a fan of the hottest band in the world. And look at that bass player, and look at the face he's making. Oh my god. 100% kosher, kids. Also on Anticene.com. So yeah, man. Larry Mann is uh, lobbying hard for an Electrico set. No problem, dude. No problem. I was, I've been playing solo acoustic punk rock for a real long time, but after I started doing this... Um, unwanted Devo set with my electric guitar in the uh, rhythm box. I, I think that's the way I'm going to go for a while now because I love having the percussion behind me and all of my percussion loops I made using a Mattel drum machine. A, yeah, I think it's called a Synsonic drum machine made by Mattel that came out in 1982 and it's got some real nasty sounds to it. So I've been beating out the rhythms into a loop pedal and playing the percussion loops and doing electric guitar bits along with it. It's a lot of fun. It sounds really nasty. So maybe on a further, a future episode of Tent Talks Tunes, I'll do a set. Actually, I did it already, didn't I? I did it already. If you go to my YouTube channel, you will see it archived. My unwanted Devo set, full-blown electric. Core, blimey, I've been going on for a while yet, and I haven't even dug into the records that I got while I was on tour. What's wrong with me? Is my life too interesting? Maybe it is. Maybe I should just slow down and stop doing fun, interesting stuff. What do you guys think? Do they have a thumbs down function on this? What do you think? I should Thumbs up if I should stop leading an interesting life. Thumbs down if you think I should continue to lead an interesting life. That didn't make any sense, did it? Never mind. Scrap it. Forget the poll. Forget it. I don't want to know. The waters are muddy enough as is. Oh, there you go. A couple of thumbs up. So I guess I'm supposed to... Oh, wait. Now we got some people who are aghast. And some people who are laughing at me. Well, shit. Ugh. So what kind of swag did I get? Well, I'll tell you. First stop of the tour, actually second stop was at Bell Tower Records in North Adams, Massachusetts. Our wonderful hosts Wes and Andrea showed us a great time. It was me, Tim, and a dude named Owen Manure. And um, I got, I paid cash dollars for the Owen Manure CD. Owen is a dude with a unique artistic vision and a red-hot band to back him up. And it was a pleasure to share the stage with Owen. I even got Owen to autograph it along with his band. Because I am not just a record mogul and a low-budget rock star. I'm also a fan. <clears throat> so if you guys want to check out some really cool outsider punk rock, Owen Manure. He's very much in the vein of Peter Stubb. Um... Maybe Daniel Johnston. I don't know. Really, really good. North Adams' finest. So yeah, I traded a whole bunch of stuff at Bell Tower Records, and I brought back a few things. Some things are just, like, so bizarre that I just had to get them. <coughs> Excuse me. And this does kind of relate to Ludon Wainwright III. The fact that at one point, 
somewhere in history, maybe around 1976, excuse me, judging by the date on the album, somehow, somewhere, there was actually enough demand in this world for some enterprising soul to press a bootleg LP by Nils Lofgren. It must have been a very, very brief window of opportunity. Because I've never seen one. Not before, not since, not back in the day. Nils Lofgren. Go figure, right? It's on the, uh, the great vintage Ruthless Rhymes label. Ruthless Rhymes is the exact same label that brought you the... Uh, LP of the Sex Pistols' Last Stand. It was called Gun Control. And that's the beauty of the boots. They would do a Sex Pistols album and a Nils Lofgren record. Why? Because there's money to be made. <laughs> it's just so bizarre. Nils Lofgren. I haven't even played this thing yet. I don't know if I ever will, but it's just really odd. I wonder if anybody ever bootlegged Ludon Wainwright III. I wonder. I wonder. Let's see. According to Bob Eaton, oh, Nils Lofgren is in Crazy Horse, as in Neil Young and Crazy Horse. Didn't know that. I knew that he had done a, a stint with um, Springsteen. Am I right about that? Nils, Nils Lofgren did back up Springsteen for a while? Or was in Springsteen's band? Is that what I'm thinking of? I don't know. What am I thinking of? Somebody tell me who Nils Lofgren served with also. But he's in Crazy Horse now. Good for him. I admire hard-working rockers who get good gigs. Now, you people know my absolute love, and I've gone on about this a lot on Tent Talks Tunes, about the phenomenon of the sleazy, cheesy, completely cynical cash-in record. And... Lo and behold, I really thought that that era of um, absolute sleazeball exploitation kind of came and went by the early 1960s. But imagine my shock and awe when I found this sucker. Tribute to Jimi Hendrix. Now, at least they're kind of upfront about it. They, they do call it a tribute to Jimi Hendrix. They don't try to pass it off as, you know... Um, the Electric Experience, or um, the Band of Slipsies. You know what I mean? They, they actually do call it a tribute to Jimi Hendrix. But in the wonderful, wonderful zero-budget tradition of the sleazy cash-in record, it features one song on side A that was originally done by Jimi Hendrix, and that's Hey Joe, and one song on side two. That was originally done by Jimi Hendrix, and that's Fire. The other eight songs on this record are just the most ridiculous, knocked off in one take, in the studio, fake psychedelia you could hope for. It's a band of very low-rent, hired musicians trying to sound like Jimi Hendrix with song titles such as Patch of Grass. Get it? Getting Busted, The Acid Test, and of course, Road's End. Also a very interesting song called Crossword, which is somehow a uh, psychedelic tale about a crossword puzzle. I'm not making this stuff up. And all of the vocals are done, as is quite often the, the fashion with these things, by a dude who, I swear to God, was probably the local weatherman or a local newscaster who they paid union scale to try to sing like Jimi Hendrix. It is so bad. And it is full of, like, the hip vernacular. And you could tell this guy was probably in his early 60s, which in the, which in the you know, the 1960s was a big deal because people in the 60s did not get this kind of stuff. So this newscaster weatherman trying to sound hip and stoned like Jimi Hendrix with these absolute zero-budget studio hacks backing him up? Priceless. 
priceless, invaluable, wonderful. Oh, and by the name, by the way, the name of the band is, as you can see right there, Jeff Cooper and the Stoned Wings. Man, you gotta love that. You know what makes it even better? When you open it up, you look at the inner sleeve, and there's an advertisement for cigarettes. German cigarette advertisement on the inner sleeve, man. These guys did everything they possibly could to make a buck at the German equivalent of Woolworths or whatever. And uh, it's Zwei Stimmungspartner, Musik und Lux. So yeah, you've got <laughs> the perfect combination, cigarettes and a fake Jimi Hendrix record. This was worth driving up to North, Madam, North Adams, Massachusetts for alone. So, so cheese ball. What was the name of the, the cheese store that used to be in all the malls? Was that Hickory Farms? Am I remembering correctly? Does any, any children of the 70s remember that? I think it was Hickory Farms was the name of the store. We had one in our local mall. And it was a cheese store. They would always have usually a cute teenage girl out front in a kind of like red and white checked shirt handing out samples of cheese in the front. And of course, all the mall rats would like cruise by and get the free cheese and kind of laugh at her because she looked kind of silly. And I don't know if anybody ever actually walked into those cheese stores. I know not, I never did. I just got the free sample of cheese and kept moving because I was, you know, shooting pinball and hanging out at the record store, you know. But anyway, Hickory Farms really, really should have been selling these Jimi Hendrix records because of the cheese quotient. The cheese quotient. So high. High. You know what I'm talking about. As Paul Stanley would say, Hi! Now, you knew the name Devo was going to come up somewhere in this sobriquet of mine, this soliloquy of mine. This is an extremely arcane reference to Devo. But a record I've been looking for for a while because of that, and that is... Captain Copter and the Twirly Birds, a.k.a. Spirit, Adventures in Potato Land. The Adventures of Captain Copter, uh, Captain Copter and Commander Cassidy in Potato Land. I always wanted this record because, uh, getting back to the topic of very obscure and arcane bootlegs, there was a Devo bootleg LP called Sing If You're Glad to Be Devo that excerpted some of the dialogue from this record about these two guys who are lost in potato land <clears throat> and the excerpts that they used on that album were sounded so weird and so bizarre that I just had to hear the entire album and to make it even doubly or triply interesting at the time that that bootleg LP was released in like 1978 this album was also unreleased it was recorded in 1973 but the record company wouldn't release it, probably because it was too damn weird. And it wasn't until 1981 that it got issued for the first time. And so, you know, it was always on my radar. It was never anything that I just really had to have right here, right now. But I've wanted it long enough, and I finally found it. The price was right, and I finally got to hear those Devo samples, or I should say the samples used on that illicit Devo album in the original context. So that was pretty cool. And it's also, it's really, it's really neat. It's a really weird, bizarre concept album with a storyline about two guys lost in potato land. What more can I say? Well, gee whiz, here's something else. You know that besides Devo, a topic that does recur occasionally here on Tent Talks Tunes is the great sport of professional wrestling. Yes. I can wax rhapsodic about professional wrestling for as long as you want. Probably longer than you want. I can do it. So I've always got my somewhat jaundiced eye, not like it is now, but open 
for anything relating to the great sport of professional wrestling. And one of those things that is just so very, very, very obscure and left to center is this album by a group on MGM Records that came out in 1960... I'm going to say 68, maybe 67. It was on the MGM label, and MGM never put dates on their releases. But this record by the Gentries has a very definite tangible and real connection to the great sport of professional wrestling. And I'm not going to say what it is. I'm going to let you post if you know what the connection to professional wrestling is with the Gentries. Post it. Because that's fun. And that will kick off, no doubt, a very long online discussion in the comments section about the Gentries and their very real connection to professional wrestling. A toast to the finest in human chess. The action in the squared circle, the only sport that matters. I hoist my jug of Danbury tap to the professional, uh, excuse me, the profession of wrestling. <clears throat> Don't look now, but I think James Pogo got it. Next up, Armageddon Records in Providence, Rhode Island. Owned by Ben from Drop Dead and staffed by really cool people. Stuck by in Providence with a big crate full of my stuff on my label and walked out with some records, including one that I've been looking for for a long time. Oh, a long time. Real long time. I was holding out for this one on 78. The reason for that being that my good pal Joe Snow, and that's his real name, Joe Snow, found a copy of this record on 78 for $1 at the flea market. And this song is so good. This song is so badass. And to have it on 78 is just so perfect that I was always exceedingly envious and jealous of him for having found it for a buck at the flea market. But that's okay, because as we know, jealousy and envy are... I'll dare say, the primary motivators of the record collector. Because you want to make your fellow collectors jealous and envious. And their jealousy and envy in turn drives you. You being me. You being you. You being all of us. Yes, jealousy and envy. That's right. I wanted this record on 78, but finding it on 45 in this drop-dead, gorgeous, beautiful Atlantic Records picture sleeve from 1950-whatever on the original yellow Atlantic label. The Coast... Uh, I almost said it wrong. The Clovers. The Clovers. The B-side, Got My Eyes on You, which is awesome but the a side and look at the other side of that sleeve oh my god is that not a thing of beauty or what your cash ain't nothing but trash by the clovers man i would suggest that you do yourself a favor right now if you love old authentic r b your cash ain't nothing but trash by the clovers backed with Got my eyes on you. You cannot go wrong. The coasters, as I'm sure we know, were the you know the main, I guess you would say novelty R and B group on Atlantic. But for my money, the Clovers blow them away. And I like you know like the coasters. Coasters are just fine. Ain't nothing wrong with the coasters. But the Clovers, Clovers get the edge. And uh, having this in my personal collection now. Ay, mi corazón. Ay. 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 
Oh, man. After that, Willimantic Records in Willimantic, Connecticut. What an absolute treat to play in the back courtyard of Willimantic Records. My good pal Joe, who's owned that place forever and ever and ever. He had me and Tim and Electric Dawn and George Hakila. I hope, you, I hope I pronounced that name right. George Hakila? 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 I don't know. H-A-K-K-I-L-A. -K -K George. And the Moving Targets. Moving Targets from Massachusetts. Man, those guys were throwing fire. To share a bill with all those other people topped by the Moving Targets? That's some good stuff, man. Outdoors and the bright sunshine and the beautiful autumnal New England weather. Man, that's a feather in the cap. Really, really is. I met some really super cool people. And of course, at Willimantic Records, found some neat things. I think I've got to keep this one for myself. The emotional, cosmic, and occult world of Joe Meek. Let's get a better shot of that. Joe Meek. Can I see some love for Joe Meek? For people who know who Joe Meek is. If you don't know who Joe Meek is, I'll give you a thumbnail synopsis. He was a British record producer in the early 1960s. He recorded who even knows how many records, including a bunch of hits, like legitimate bona fide hits in his apartment. He set up this incredible like Rube Gold. Ah, I'm seeing a lot of recognition from Joe Meek. Yes. He set this incredible Rube Goldberg scotch tape and coat hanger tape recorder DIY outer space capsule recording studio and recorded some of the damnedest stuff you ever heard. And this uh, compilation album's got a whole bunch of that stuff on it. And um, he had one genuine... U actually had a couple of U.S. hit singles. One was a song called Telstar by the Tornadoes. And the other one was called, uh, I think it's properly called Have I Got the Right by the Honeycombs. Just look up either of those and listen to the production values on those. And it, it's some really wild stuff. He did some really crazy things with homemade electronics and reverb and echo and um, just like from outer space. So Joe Meek compilation of Very happy about that. And what else did I find at Willimantic Records? What do you know? The Outer Bounds of Sound by my band, Ultra Money. Hot dog and hot damn. I might have sold this to uh, Joe at Willimantic myself years ago. I've been out of it forever. It's been out of print forever. So I did what any rational band member would do. I bought my own record back at his price. No problem. So if any Ultra Bunny completists out there need this, I got it. The last and only one. No plans at all to reissue this. This was on the great Noiseville label run by my good pal Jim Gibson. As Rasta would say, the early Jim Gibson. And uh, the Outer Bounds of Sound collection was an entire series of limited edition LPs that he put out. Gosh, around 2011. So this thing's been completely out of print for the last 11 years. And to find one in the wild at a friend's record store, very cool. So I got one. If anybody wants one, if you're an Ultra Bunny completist, you talk to me. I am willing to part with this one. Joe, a.k.a. Mal Inowski here on Facebook... knows my personal taste very well. He knows that by presenting me as a sort of playa's bonus with an eight track of Phoenix by Grand Funk is going to make me pop my cork in a good way because it's Grand Funk, because it's on eight track, because that's the best of two worlds colliding violently. Not only that, but one... Two, three, four, five, six. And there's another one that I didn't show you. So 
seven, count them, seven copies of whipped cream and other delights so that I can nurse my morbid obsession with having as many of these as possible. And one of them's got this incredible customized back cover art. No doubt unique. And if you guys want to see how deep my obsession is, go to my YouTube channel and look up a, the past episode of Tent Talks Tunes where I talk about nothing but the variants of whipped cream and other delights. I got a little poco en el loco en mi coco when it comes to this album. We played a really cool brewery cigar bar in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania called The Wooden Match with a band I never met before called The Swamp Rats. Really, really great acoustic duo, guitar and banjo, guy and a gal. Uh, we shared the stage with them, really nice people, and also really good artists. I found these mysteriously laying on the ground in front of my car the next morning. And I'm going to zoom on in. I'm going to presume that the new camera can do the job when it comes to focus and resolution. That's genuine pen and ink drawing, kids. By the Swamp Rats. And I am happy to show it to you. Because I love this kind of stuff. That, my friends, is real art. Real art. Gotta love it. And then the next record store stop was with my good pal David Prino in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, at Angry, Young, and Poor. Dave Prino just gifted me straight out this really cool picture disc. It's from Japan. It's in Japanese. I don't know what the name of it, but it's got one of the members from the Stalin. Now, if any of you hardcore people from the 80s who are into international hardcore are out there, you should know the name of the Stalin. If you don't, look it up. But the Stalin, they were major in the early 80s. I myself actually have in my career owned a couple of original Japanese pressing of Stalin records. No mean feat, kids. They're long gone, but I can say I actually did own some Stalin records. So uh, one of the main dudes from the Stalin's got this noise project that's on a picture disc. Haven't played it yet, but I'm sure it's going to scare Harry right out of the room, which is why I'm going to wait until he's not in the room. So I can play this. Thank you, Dave. I appreciate that very much. And thank you for hooking me up with some original bona fide American country western, mu country western music records by Buck Owens and Roy Acuff. I never in my life ever took country music seriously until just a few years ago when I was introduced to the good stuff. And... Um, like, you know, I was always a big fan of the blues and, and like any kind of old music, I guess. But I never got into country, but now I'm really digging, I'm really digging my potatoes with American country music and learning what the good stuff is and what the bad stuff is. I have even learned that there was good 90s country. Think about that for a minute. Think about that for a minute. Good 90s country, there is such a thing. There's good country from all eras. And, you know, that's just like all forms of music. There's good and there's bad from any time period. Doesn't matter what it is. You got to wade your way through the swill and the jive turkey BS to find the good stuff, but it is out there. So my country music odyssey increaseth and goeth on. And it's been a real thrill of discovery. I've heard some really, really great stuff. And I'm very much looking forward to checking out the Buck Owens and Roy Acuff. And a couple other things I picked up, which I don't have in my fingertips right now. Um, honorable mention to my good pal Mike at Mr. Suit Records, also in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. I only got one record off of him. And I, it's one of those I don't have with me. It sort of got lost in the shuffle somewhere. But Mr. Suit has been a longtime stop of mine. He is going to be losing his brick-and-mortar location at the end of the year. And if you guys know me, you know I can relate to that story. So if you're anywhere near there in Lancaster, stop by, say hello to Mike. He's a good dude. He's got some really good stuff in his shop. And um, just around the corner from Dave over at the Angry Young and Poor. And there's a really good vegan restaurant there, too. I got some vegan pizza the night that we played there. So 
fun. Just got to watch the parking, man. They are brutal with the parking rules in Lancaster. It's one of the few towns that I've... I don't even know how many parking tickets I've got in Lancaster. I don't even want to think about it. And I got them all fair and square, too. Like... <sighs> I don't want to think about it. Don't want to talk about it. So I'm not gonna. Anyway, gang, that is the basic encapsulation of my record adventures on this most recent tour that I did with my pal Tim Holhouse. And once again, probably, in fact, I can say for sure there's not going to be a Tent Talks Tunes for at least the next two weeks because I will be on the road with the almighty anti-scene. That is the almighty anti-scene. Strumming the Thunder Lumba in Wilmington, North Carolina, Jacksonville, Florida, and Mobile, Alabama, November 3rd, 4th, and 5th. Go to antiscene.com for all the information, or just look at my Facebook page. <clears throat> the flyer is posted. Um, so yeah, no 10 Talks tunes, but when I get back in a few weeks, I will probably be able to repeat today's exercise, because... Even though I won't be hitting any record stores while I'm on the road with the band, I will be spending some time before our run of shows and after our run of shows. And you know there's going to be record stores involved there. Because I will be packing plenty of TPOS product with me, as always, for the record stores. So, as Rare Earth once said, covering the great Motown song, Get ready! Get ready, oh, 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 get ready, get ready for Tent Talks Tunes in a few weeks featuring more vinyl picks and hits to click. And so, yeah, I'm going to sign off right now. No sign of Harry. Harry has remained outdoors this entire time. So on behalf of Harry, I say thanks for tuning in. Hope everybody out there is rocking and rolling and uh, doing all the controlling that they need to do. And Lord willing and the creeks don't rise, I'll see you guys in a few weeks. This is Malcolm Tent saying so long from the Nutmeg State. <laughs>